we're joined today by General Martin Dempsey. Sir, thank you for your time today. My pleasure. Looking forward to the conversation. Well, let's just get right into the topic of leadership. Uh, sir, how do you define leadership? Well, it, uh, at its most, first of all, there's been plenty of books written about that. And uh, I th through the course of my career, I've tried to understand as much as I can about the topic. But I mean, clearly, leadership is, is, the, uh, is the acceptance of responsibility for an outcome. Um, and that's, I think that's true whether it happens to be military leadership or whether it's leadership uh, in industry or in, in, uh, in government. Um, it's also some combination of a commitment to the outcome, but also the commitment to the people with, you can't lead yourself. I mean, I suppose you can, but it wouldn't be a very interesting endeavor. And so it's also a commitment to somehow develop those who choose to accept your leadership. And by the way, that, that is a uh, part of leadership. That is to say, um, leadership often comes with authority and responsibility. But my definition of leadership is I it's important to add to that, that the understanding that those who you lead make the deliberate decision whether to consider you as a leader and to follow your lead. And so there's this kind of dynamic interaction uh, uh, between leader and led uh, that has to mature over time to build trust. I think trust is probably the most, the single most important quality to, to, uh, to develop, if you will, or to deliver in this thing called leadership. So, you know, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those um, words that as you begin to unpack it, it begins to have more meaning. And I would, you know, for those that will be watching this interview, I would say that uh, if, if you ever decide, if you ever decide that you've got the definition about right, you're wrong because it's, a, it's something that requires constant study and constant work. Excellent. Um, next question. How is humility important to the success of a leader? Well, I mentioned that leadership is the interaction of leader and led and, and has to be um, based on a relationship of trust. Otherwise, there's no real leadership. There's coercion, but there's no real leadership. I think that humility is the trait that allows subordinates to enter into that trust relationship. In other words, if, if subordinates or employees, if you will, um, in the private sector, if they believe that the leader is um, engaged in his or her activity for their own purposes, uh, if they perceive that uh, the leader takes all the credit, none of the blame, you know, you've heard that cliche, sure. uh, then they won't, you know, they're not going to enter into that trust relationship. So I think humility is, uh, is an important component not the most important component, but certainly an com important component of leadership so that you provide that foundation. The trust relationship that I suggested to you is really what defines uh, a leadership uh, or a leader. And what's the hardest part about being a leader? Well, the hardest part is the responsibility. I mean, you know, the, the particularly in our profession, when, you're, when you realize the responsibility that you have, you know the old cliche that a leader is responsible for the performance of the unit and all of its members, um, both on and, o and off duty, you know, everything they do and everything they fail to do. That's an enormous responsibility. And that one, that one in particular probably is unique to the military profession. But it's, not, it's sort of what captured my imagination and my soul many years ago is this, you know, the, the degree to which a military leader does have responsibility at a very young age, I mean, from the time that a non-commissioned officer pins on the, you know, the sergeant stripes and, uh, and an officer pins on his second lieutenant or her second lieutenant bars. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the hardest part is the responsibility. And along the same subject, Martin, what's your definition of integrity? You know, the, uh, again, one of these words, w we tend to pile abstraction on abstraction on abstraction. And, um, you know, I've often, um, in a pleasant way, been in involved in discussions about the, the what's the distinction between uh, integrity and honor, honesty. You know, I mean, fill in the blanks. But so, so to answer the question, and this is a this is my personal answer, but I think that everyone has to grasp it themselves. 
I think that um, my definition of, in, in, of integrity is, is the ability to act um, for, um, for noble purposes. And so, you know, there is th this balance between acting for your own, um, s for your own personal benefit and there is the, the sort of competing requirement as a leader to act for the benefit of others. In our profession, there's the third element, which is acting for the benefit of the nation. And I think my defini definition of integrity is the ability to knit those things together so that you don't exclude one or the other. I mean, look, human nature is not going to allow you to completely discount your own well-being in any action you take. But I think integrity comes in as you as you begin to find, as you mature, as your understanding of leadership matures, as your understanding of even the word integrity matures, I think it's finding that balance among um, what's best for you personally, what's best for those who are serving with and for you, and what's best for the nation. Sir, how do you as a leader foster the responsible use of power? <coughs> well, by the way, that, that phrase you just used, the responsible use of power, is exactly the definition of, that is exactly the principle on which our service as a profession uh, is built. So in other words, you know, the, the diff we could also discuss here, I'm not interested in doing so, but we could discuss the difference between an occupation and a profession. But the military profession is unique in that it holds a monopoly on the responsible use of power on behalf of the nation. So that phrase, the responsible use of power, is what makes us a profession. And when you ask me how do I ensure that we are exercising uh, power responsibly, it, it, it starts and maybe finishes, but certainly starts with the fact that we bring into the service young men and women from a variety of backgrounds. We ask them to embrace a particular set of values and those particular set of values then begin to, def to define the profession. And once you have that, then you count upon those within the profession to understand enough about power, force, lethal effects, non-lethal effects, that they will execute them responsibly. I mean, so there's, there's a yin and yang, almost inseparable element between being a profession and living up to that responsibility to use power um, in a proper way. But, you know, I mean, we could, I could elaborate a bit more and discuss um, the morality, really, the, mora the, the ethics of force, which, which turn on really three aspects. One is, um, for what um, intention are you using force? Mm -hmm. With what behavior? And do you have a reasonable chance of producing the outcome? So the responsible use of force has to have the proper intention, it, it seems to me. This is a philosophic argument, but it's an important one. Uh, so your intentions have to be sound. Um, the way you apply it has to, be, has to account for the behaviors we expect. So as a nation, we have a certain expectation in how we will, we will apply force. And generally, it, it's with precision. Uh, limiting as much as possible human suffering and collateral damage, and, uh, you know, and, and, and we could go on and on. But so it's the intention, the behavior, and then the outcome. It, so, for example, it would be improper to apply force if you didn't have a reasonable chance of achieving the outcome uh, that you intend. See what I mean? Yes. So there's the, there's the, this is, you know, none of these questions are, are all that um, simple, and they shouldn't be. But you have the, the, the mandate to us to build professionals to then trust them to responsibly apply force against that standard of intent, behavior, and outcome. Excellent. So what advice would you provide to a person about how to be an effective leader? Um, first of all, I, uh, yeah, that's I mean, how to be an effective leader. I, I think that the first thing you have to do is be yourself. You know, you'll, you'll often, particularly a young, a young NCO, non-commissioned officer, a young officer, I think sometimes you, there's a tendency to, you know, to look around and, and decide that uh, you pick out a particular role model and, and that you want to become them. Now, it's okay to aspire to their values, to their skills, to their approach, but the first thing that you must understand as a leader is you, you are who you are. 
and we're all very different. You know, I mean, that's one of the great strengths of our nation and our military is the diversity of the backgrounds and, and that, that we draw into the military. And then the way that we mold them into a professional committed to a certain set of values. But they're, all, they're always themselves. And so the lens through which they will apply those values have to be very personal values. If a leader isn't true to him or herself, that'll be quickly identifiable by those who they try to lead. And the leader won't be effective. Second thing I would say is that um, you know, a leader has to be someone who um, is committed to, develop, to the development of their subordinates. You know, this isn't just, you know, we always talk about that balance between accomplishing the mission and developing the young men and women entrusted to our care. I don't worry much about the, the accomplishment of the mission part. You know, the, our, in the military profession in particular, we're going to accomplish the mission. I mean, it's just such a part of our culture that, that the default mechanism is to accomplish the mission. The piece that I do become concerned about on occasion, as these missions become so, so complex, so pervasive, so repetitive, is that we'll begin to forget about the other half of the equation. And the other half of the equation is that a true leader is deeply committed to the development of the men and women who serve and, and incredibly do the things we ask them to do. And so, you know, it's some combination of those two things, I think, that for me define a leader with one addition. And that is, there's a little cliche that I carry around sometimes with me that's, you know, leaders are readers. But it's not about being a reader. It's about being committed to developing yourself. So I would be a pretty miserable example if I were satisfied that, you know, that I was uh, a fully developed and satisfactory leader when I was a colonel commanding an armored cavalry regiment. Because the jobs that we ask, see, you know, all of us, we, you know, as we move each other around into different positions, they're all different, I mean, literally different, and they all have a different set of responsibilities. There are some, there are some sort of enduring things that, you know, that move with you from place, integrity is one, moves you with you from place to place. But, you know, the ability to adapt, to embrace change, to to see change before it washes over you, to have the courage to do something about it, uh, you know, to make those really tough decisions that rise to the level of moral courage. All of those things require you to continually to, to, to develop yourself. So you really have to be a lifelong learner. And uh, you know, if ever you decide you can stop learning, then you're, you're, uh, you know, fundamentally you've stopped leading. Well, that's a perfect segue into my next question, which is how do you deal with loyalty conflicts when principles conflict with organizational practices, personal agendas versus mission, for example? Well, you know, I mean, this is the, the military. I'll speak to the military profession notably because that's, you know, that's the cloth I wear. But, uh, you know, the, this is a human enterprise. And so all of the strengths and weaknesses that you'd expect to find in any human enterprise, you're going to find them in our profession. I think we tend to be a little better at vetting and, and allowing those who don't need to serve to, uh, to find other employment. I think we're, um, we're a little better at culling, meaning I think we, you know, our merit-based promotion system um, is very effective at um, ensuring that the people that rise and continue to rise embrace the values and don't generate those kind of um, loyalty conflicts as you've described them. But that, none of that means you'll never encounter any of that. Um, I mean, the, when other, you know, we're throwing, your, I'm throwing around leadership cliches left and right here today, but another one of them is, you know, you can't walk past a, 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 an act of indiscipline or a mistake if you have as a leader, then you've set a new standard. And so I think it's, it's the constant vigilance um, one might call it vision at the loftiest levels, but it's seeing at the more junior levels. Being able to see the things that are understanding, you know, see first and understand uh, the things going on around you, and then not being, you know, not being satisfied. There's a, you know, a great quotation out of Google. Uh, Google's corporate mantra is never settle. And I think that's, that's kind of uh, applicable to our profession as well. In our profession, if we just simply can't settle for mediocrity. I mean, we have to be constantly seeking the, to improve ourselves, improve our unit. And so when you encounter these, 
as you described it, these disloyalties or dysfunctionalities. I mean, in our profession, it, it can be a matter of life and death, and you have to confront them. And, um, you know, as a result, we tend to be a, a, a very, you know, introspective uh, profession. You know, the after-action review, we, when we do anything, when we do a, a training exercise or an actual military operation, um, in Iraq or Afghanistan or elsewhere, there will always be an after-action review in which we're very almost disarmingly candid about what, what went well and what didn't go well. And it's, it's, it's exactly intended to ensure that the team stays together with, a common, with common purpose and that we don't uh, allow those disloyalties or dysfunctionalities to propagate. But it, it takes work. And, um, you know, I, and I, but I think it's, uh, it's work that certainly we should embrace as leaders. So as an executive, how do you encourage independent thinking and avoid groupthink? Well, first of all, you have to um, express, you know, most, mostly it's by what you do, but you have to begin that process by what you say. And so uh, I'll give you a personal example. When I joined the joint, the joint staff, the, you know, over the course of time, because the pace of our activities notably in Iraq and Afghanistan, has been so, so, so aggressive and so consuming. Um, we've, we began to outsource our thinking in many ways. You know, we, we hi and I'm not, I'm, by the way, I'm not against contractors, and, but I do think that we probably overcorrected because we wanted to keep the uniforms in the, f in the fight. We probably have overcorrected a bit in outsourcing our thinking. So if someone were to say to me, I need a, you know, what do you think Joint Force 2020 would look, should look like? You know, a couple of years ago, the answer would be, well, let's ask, you know, let's, I won't use any corporate names here, but let's ask this corporation or that corporation, you know, to organize a study and, you know, we'll give them six months and, and uh, they'll come in and, you know, they will allow them to interview and, and do all the research necessary. And then they can come in and give us some ideas and then we'll decide which of the ideas to take. Well, that, you know, that was a useful tool, but it's one that I think we've probably overused. And so the first thing I did when I came to the joint staff was, ex was declare that I'm not going to outsource my thinking. If I, if I want a question answered, I'm going to ask the extraordinarily talented men and women that work for me in the joint staff, or I'll go to one of the war colleges, Army, Navy, War College, um, Air Force, war co Air War College, or National Defense University, or I'll go to one of the military academies where we have made an, 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 an immense investment in the faculty, and I'll insource it. And, um, you know, people got a little bit uh, uh, nervous about that, but so, and but we have. Now, to your point about how do you avoid uh, groupthink or being given the information that people think I want, not what I want, that gets at what I do. So if I, you know, if I were to get a piece of staff work or if I would, in a meeting, ask a question and get a, a you know, an unsatisfactory answer, my reaction to that is what, is what sends a message to people about whether they can take some risk with me or not. Uh, and, it, and it is a difficult position. You know, the chairman is a, I mean, it, it doesn't feel like it to me personally. I mean, I'm, every morning I wake up and wonder how in the world did this happen? But, but the point is that, you know, because I'm the senior military officer in the entire armed forces, you know, it is a bit intimidating when people come to, uh, to either present something to me or ask me a question or present me a, you know, an action ready for signature. So how I interact with them, you know, if it's collaborative, if it's inquisitive, if I value their thoughts, and, and sort of the opposite would be if I were impatient with them, if I were demeaning to them, if I were dismissive of them, then all, if I did that once, then I've lost that person for the entire tour. So mm -hmm. I'm very aware of the fact by the way, I'm not perfect. There are days, there are moments when, uh, when I know I'm probably a little shorter with people than I should be or a little less patient than I should be. But generally, I go into each engagement knowing that, it, that you know, when this young man or woman comes in to brief me on something or present a paper or present an action for me, this might be the only time in 90 or 120 or 180 days that they see me. And their impression of me as a leader is important to me. And so I try to empower them uh, to stretch their thinking out and not believe they have to come back with some template. Um, and by the way, the, the process of moving paper through the Pentagon can drive you toward a template. And so 
I have to encourage them to break the mold. Sometimes that's successful, sometimes it's not. But it's, so it's both about saying, establishing your expectations verbally, but it's more important in how I deal with people. Excellent, let me ask you this. How do you balance vision with follow through in times when resources are limited? Uh, I'm not sure that you can have a vision absent um, resources. You know, the Clausewitz famously described the, you know, the, the triad of uh, ends, ways, and means. And he did that, and they're, and they're connected. You know, you can have, I can have all the vision I want about Joint Force 2020 um, if I did it in an unconstrained environment or even in with unconstrained thinking. And what I mean by constrained, you know, there are, l there are resource constraints, there are you know, there's political constraints. There's some things this nation will never do. You know, we will, we're just not, uh, our value system will, will often shape our actions. So, you know, the unconstrained approach to vision is a fool's errand, to tell you the truth. I mean, the reality is that your vision has to be resource conscious or resource sensitive, or, it, or you'll, you will simply frustrate yourself and those around you. Now that said, I, I sense that where the question really wanted me to go is, you know, if I really think the nation needs something, whether that something was a particular platform or a program or a, or a structure or, or a mission, you know, w will I have the moral courage to argue for the resources to get it? Of course I will. And when the resources come up short, as they often do, then it's my responsibility to articulate risk. So, so, uh, so to answer your question um, as closely as I possibly can, vision isn't vision unless it's resource sensitive. And, so, and this, that's the reality. And by the way, that's always been true. It's just more true today. And secondly, the real responsibility in linking um, vision to resources is risk. And that's my responsibility, to articulate risk. And then if the risk gets too high, having the moral courage to actually have that conversation. <coughs> Excuse me. Last question. What leader did you use as a role model and why? Yeah, I, I saw that question coming, and uh, it really, it's an interesting question because, uh, you know, on the one hand, you, you know, I could start spouting off World War II generals and admirals, and, and of course, I'm going to do that at the end of this. But, um, but I'll tell you that I'm still in the service today because of my first platoon sergeant and my first uh, troop commander in the Army. Because if, if something doesn't capture your imagination, I, I, I described it earlier as capturing your soul. We talk about it as, you know, somebody's got to light your fire. I mean, pick your metaphor. But the point is if, if somebody doesn't, in those early years, um, find a way to convince you that, that what we ask you to do as a profession is worth it and that the profession will, as a matter of priority, develop you. So it's, it is about the mission, but, but we're also committed to develop you. you. That's how we lose kids. We don't lose kids, generally, we don't lose kids because of money. We don't lose kids because we move them around too often or send them off to war too frequently. We lose kids because leaders don't inspire them to, to, you know, to continue to serve. And you know, I mean, that's, that's troubling to me. And, and uh, so I dig into, if, I'm, if I find a young man or woman who's recently out, I'll, you know, I'll sit him down and I'll say, tell me, tell me where we didn't you know, convince you that you should have remained part of this profession. So the, 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 the issue is you, you answer that question about who inspires you, not once in your career, but a hundred times in your career. Every place you go, you know, you're on the lookout for a leader who, I mean, look, to put it in sort of common language, you're, on a, you're, you're looking for someone you want to be like when you grow up. And uh, by the way, that's what I used to tell my battalion commanders when I was a division commander. I, I told them in, in more than one setting, I said, look, you, you could have the best, I'm a tanker, so I said, your battalion could score the best gunnery scores of any battalion in the division. You could just, you know, completely knock it out of the park at the, combat maneuver training centers, you know, you, 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 you know, you could just accomplish every mission I ask you better than anybody else. But I tell you what, if the young men and women that are serving, those captains and lieutenants, those buck sergeants and staff sergeants, if they don't want to be like you, you know, when they continue to mature, then you're not a good leader. You know, you're a good manager, you know, you're probably a pretty decent taskmaster, 
probably a pretty good technician when it comes to tank gunner. But it's, it'll be the people who determine whether you're a good leader or not. Okay, now I told you at the end of this I would have to you know, jump up to the lofty levels of you know, who's your famous historical figure. I have a couple actually, and, and they're all for different reasons. You know, uh, Winfield Scott at the end of, uh, not, a, not a famous name really, John M. Schofield. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, leaders who after the Civil War, you know, and, and much, much after actually, but began to put together the professional force we have today, who, who took what was a grotesquely hideous, complex political environment. You know, I mean, we had Reconstruction in the South, you know, and, and, um, and a Northern climate, w w you know, where we were continuing to try to punish the South for their transgressions during the Civil War. So guys, you know, like that were able to not only unite the military, but unite the nation, which is kind of phenomenal. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, as he came into service and um, finally became the leader that Lincoln was looking for. And, I, and I, I do mean it exactly that way. I mean, what this nation and what our military owe the commander in chief is a leader who he can trust. And, you know, as you know, famously, Lincoln was, you know, casting aside pretty reluctant and timid uh, northern generals for, for quite a bit of time. Robert E. Lee, because of what he did at the end of the war, I mean, he could have encouraged the South and the Confederate Army to to become an insurgency and our country would have been suffering for another 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. Incredible moral courage uh, in the face of that, in the face of that decision. And then I'll just fast forward up through and to George Marshall, who I think is probably, uh, probably our best uh, military leader in throughout our entire history. Um, with the possible exception of George Washington, and I'll come to him in a moment. but. George Marshall, as you know, um, desperately wanted to go serve in either the, the uh, European theater or the Pacific theater, but he became the indispensable man inside of, uh, in s at the strategic level, working with FDR, uh, working with some incredible personalities who were military leaders, you know, guys like MacArthur and Eisenhower, Patton, Bradley, Nimitz, Halsey, you know, fill in the blanks, sure. all of whom had huge, you know, personalities. And he was the leader the, the, uh, who held it all together, really, and, and, uh, and found a way to do that. And then at the end of his military service, the story famously, he was retiring, and the president called and asked if he would go off to be the, uh, uh, the ambassador to China. And, you know, imagine going home and telling your wife that after you've just slugged your way through a war, a war with her, you know, seeing a little less of you than she probably wanted to. Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. I mean, you know, there's a, a, a man who truly served, you know. And now let me back all the way to Washington, who, um, who at the end of the, civ of the Revolutionary War, you famously remember, up in Newburgh, New York, when the, when the officer corps was about to mutiny because the Continental Congress had failed to appropriate money to keep the force um, solid and, to, and f in fact, to pay them. Um, Washington rode up and, and uh, was able to, to, in a way that, you know, when you look back on it, you wonder, you know, just how was it possible? But he was able to fundamentally talk them out of it by simply pointing out what they had fought for. And that <coughs> what they had fought for was so important in history that to do anything other than to support it at that moment in history would have just been unthinkable, unimaginable. And, and uh, in fact, what he did was he, he uh, and y I often wonder whether he did it on purpose or it was just captured. But he, you know, he pulled out, he took his glasses off and he pulled out a handkerchief and he was cleaning and he said, you'll have to forgive me, but I've, I've lost my sight in the service of my nation. Wow. Sir, your insights have been fascinating and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to meet you. Thank you for your time. Thank today. you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks.